The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. He's a chip off the old block, like father, like, like mother, like. These are the things that we say, right, when we look at our children and we see them doing the same things that we ourselves do. And sometimes that's our great joy, isn't it? Every new parent can remember, or maybe is still going through this phase, looking into the face of that little baby and trying to figure out whose nose does this baby have, whose ears, whose earlobes, whose fingernails, whose toes, whose knees, whose elbows. Is that genetically given? I, maybe it is, I don't know, but you get my point. It's not just the parents who love to do this, who love to see how children look just like their parents, it's everybody. Brothers and sisters get in on the act. Grandparents certainly love to get in on the act. Oh, he has my eyebrows. Oh, he has your chin. Even aunts and uncles try to get in on it. Cousins get in on it. And even, even people who are unrelated like to say things like, oh, oh, I can see that they have your eyes. We delight in this, don't we? The physical, genealogical heritage that we pass on from parents to children, but it goes deeper, doesn't it? It goes deeper than just the color of your eyes, the color of your hair. Parents and grandparents and maybe aunts and uncles and maybe even cousins and brothers and sisters can see in the way that children move, in the way that children talk, in the way that children behave, they can see in imitation of mom and dad. And sometimes that's to our great joy, and sometimes, sometimes it's to our chagrin. How did he say that? Who taught him to do that? Oh, it was me. Our genes are powerful, aren't they? And you can see how the genetic heritage that you pass on to your children comes out in all sorts of physical, observable ways, but it goes deeper, right? Our genes have a way of getting involved in all kinds of things. And so in the Uppold family, we pass on something called Uppold speed. You want to know what Uppold speed is? Uppold speed is the exact opposite of what it sounds like. Uppold speed is when you're slow. And all Uppolds are slow. We are all slow. Not a single one of us is a fast runner. We are distance runners. We're farmers. We're not sprinters. And that's passed on through genetics. Maybe your families have those. I think almost every family has these certain mannerisms, these certain characteristics that are passed on from parents to children. This is the way God has created us. It would be a strange thing, wouldn't it, if your children looked nothing like you, if they sounded nothing like you, if they behaved nothing like you. Today, in our gospel reading, Jesus talks about this very thing, that children resemble their parents, that children are imitators of their parents, and that in the children, you can see a reflection, a reflection of the parents. The question that's put before us is this, whose children are you? Whose children really are you? Now, Jesus was talking to the Jews, and just a few verses before the reading that we had this morning, he told them this, if you are the sons of Abraham, if you are the children of Abraham, then do the works of Abraham. It was the great privilege of the Jewish people to be the descendants of Abraham. He was the one who God had given the promises to after all, right? And in his family, God had promised, in you and in your offspring, your children, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That's a pretty big privilege, isn't it? But that was a privilege that the Jewish people then, and even to some extent still now, have taken from being a privilege to being a point of ungodly pride. And Jesus' whole dispute with them throughout his ministry, not just in John chapter 8, but throughout his ministry was this. If you really are the children of Abraham, then you would receive me. Isn't that what he said in so many words? Isn't that what he was doing in so many words? Here comes the promised offspring of Abraham. He comes to his own, and his own people spit on him, 
pull out his beard, mock him, revile him, throw him outside the city, and eventually will crucify him. By their deeds, by their actions, they show that even though they may have been able to say, hey, we are the children of Abraham, we can trace our lineage back. We have Abraham's nose, we have Abraham's ears, we have Abraham's mannerisms. They didn't have the thing that really counted. But what about you? Whose children are you? And I don't mean tell me your mom and your dad and your grandparents. Some of you are really into genealogy, which is really cool. By the way, you can trace your family line back to like 1500. I think that's awesome. But that's not really the point of our question this morning. Whose children are you? Are you sons of Abraham and daughters of Abraham? Are you children of him or are you children of someone else? If you are the children of Abraham, then you should do the things that Abraham does. You should walk like Abraham. You should talk like Abraham. You should move like Abraham. You should be like Abraham. And here's what Abraham was all about. Father Abraham is the great father of faith and obedience. Father Abraham, let me repeat that, is the great father of faith and obedience. And so if you would be children of Abraham who are blessed, if you want to be children of Abraham, then don't look for genealogical connections to him. Don't try to trace it through your mother or your father or your aunt or your uncle, but learn to be, just like Abraham, men and women of faith and obedience. Let me remind you about Father Abraham. Father Abraham is called the father of faith precisely because of the story of his life. You remember the story of Abraham, don't you? You remember how God called him when he was a pretty old man. He was 75 years old. Some of you have reached that golden ripe age. Well, God called Abraham when he was 75 years old and he gave him a great promise. Abraham, in you and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Now, how many of you 75-year-old men would say, all right, sign me up to have a son? It's probably not very high on your priority list. After all, having children is a lot of work. And there's a reason that God gives young people children, because you need a lot of energy. If you don't believe me, come over to my house. You can take care of my kids for tonight, and you can see what's required. And yet, that's what God promised Abraham that he would be a father, that he would be the father not just of a kid who was really smart and really athletic and really happy and made him really proud, but that he would be the father of a child who would one day bring the blessing of God to the whole world. And finally, 25 years later, God gave Abraham that son, For 25 years, Abraham waited. For 25 years, Abraham had to live by faith as the father of faith that what God said, he would do. And if Abraham looked at his own body, he would be reminded of this fact. After all, he was an old man. Scripture says that he was as good as dead. And it was to this man, this old man who was as good as dead, and to his wife, who, by the way, was no spring chicken herself, it was to this old man and to this old woman who was barren, that God gave the promise of a son to emphasize, to emphasize that it was nothing in them, it wasn't the power of the father or the fertility of the mother, but that everything depended on God's promise. And Abraham learned to live by that promise. He was the great father of faith, but he was also the father of obedience. And you heard that in our Old Testament reading today. God tested Abraham. Abraham. He tested his obedience. And I want you as sons and daughters of Abraham to learn to follow in the example, to walk in the way of your father Abraham in faith and in obedience. I want you to talk like Abraham. I want you to walk like Abraham. I want you to be like Abraham. So notice, notice the way that our father talks. God calls to him, Abraham, and he says, here I am. What wonderful words. Imagine if your children talked to you like this. If I called out to my son and he said, here I am, father, instead of what? (laughs) 
Wouldn't it be a beautiful thing, parents in the room? Wouldn't it be wonderful, you wives in the room, if your husbands, when you called their names, if they responded, here I am, instead of, ah, yes. (laughs) And you wives, if your husbands called to you and said, dear, and you said, here I am. What a delight you would be to your husbands. Now we can laugh about it, but there's something important in Abraham's response that I want you to imitate as his children. Because what Abraham shows us is a willing obedience, not a grudging obedience. We're all very familiar with a grudging obedience. That's the way your kids behave when you tell them to go wash their hands before they eat. That's the way your kids respond when you tell them to make sure that they make their bed in the morning. That's the way that husbands respond when the wives say, hey, have you done those things I've told you to do for the last seven months? Yes, yes, I have. Abraham is the father of willing obedience. Here I am. I'm ready. That's maybe the better way to translate it. When God calls to Abraham, he says, I'm ready. And he doesn't just say it once, but it's throughout our reading today. When the Lord calls to Abraham, his manner of response, his habit of response was always to say, I'm ready. But notice that that can be a little bit dangerous because God can command things that Abraham probably really didn't want to do things that are frightful, things that are dreadful. Abraham, I'm ready. Offer your son, your only son, Isaac, your beloved son, that son that I gave you by promise, that son who has all the promises of salvation bound up in his body. Offer him, Abraham, offer him to me. And you kind of wonder, did Abraham wish that he would have said something other than, I'm ready? But he is ready, and he's willing, and he goes, and he takes Isaac. And lo and behold, look at what the son of Abraham does. Isaac also is willing. He walks with his father. He carries the wood of his father. And when he asks, Father, where is the sacrifice? And his dad doesn't really answer the question, God will provide my son. Isaac starts to put two and two together, and he doesn't run away. He goes with dad like a true son. He is bound. He is placed on that altar. And then God calls to Abraham as he's in the act of offering up his son. Abraham, Abraham, and Abraham says again, I'm ready. And this time, this time the answer is far different. Not offer your son, but Abraham, stop. And Abraham stops. You want to be children of Abraham? Then learn this posture. Learn this habit. Learn this way of being. That whatever God says to you, your response will be, I'm ready. I'm ready to do your will. And I hasten to add, don't worry, God is not going to tell you to offer your son, your beloved son. He's not going to tell you to do that, but he will command you to be faithful to him. He will command you to do things that the rest of the world may look at and scoff at. He will tell you to honor your father and your mother. He will tell you to be faithful to your vows. He will tell you to be kind. He will tell you to forgive those who sin against you. He will tell you to love your enemies, things that do not come to us by nature. And yet, as children of Abraham, we must learn to say, God, I'm ready to do your will, not like a begrudging two-year-old, not like an angry, insolent teenager, but like Father Abraham, who was ready to do whatever God commanded him. Now, there are other children in our gospel reading, those who are not sons of Abraham, and you can see that by disobeying Jesus, by rejecting Jesus, they show that they are children of someone else. Jesus says they are sons of Satan, Sons of Satan, not according to the flesh, but sons of Satan who love, instead of the truth of God's word, who love lies. Well, that was just them, right? That would never happen to us. That would never happen anymore, right, Pastor? Please tell me that would never happen. If I told you that, I would be a liar. 
For the truth is that people still in our day and age, and if you look in your own heart, you will find this same temptation is close to you, that we do prefer a comfortable lie to a hard truth. We prefer a comfortable lie to a hard truth because it makes us feel good, right? Wouldn't it be nice if every time you went to your doctor, he looked at you and said, man, everything is looking great. Cholesterol, right on line. Everything's looking good. You've got another, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 years. It would be nice, but we all recognize the danger of that, don't we? If something's wrong with me, I want someone to tell me the truth, not a comfortable lie. I want someone to tell me, it looks like you have cancer here. We need to do immediate surgery. It looks like your cholesterol is way out of whack. You've got to make a change right now, or it's going to be curtains. In those moments, we want the truth. We do not want to hear lies. Well, is it any different when God's word comes to us? Should we always expect God to tell us, you're being good boys and good girls? Everything is going smoothly. That would be a comfortable lie. That was the comfortable lie of the Jews in Jesus' day. And when Jesus called them out and said, you are not listening to the words of God, you are not following the way of Abraham, they preferred the comfortable lie. We're the children of Abraham. We don't like this guy. We're going to get rid of him. They preferred the comfortable lie to the truth. And so they showed themselves sons of the devil, who was a liar from the beginning and whose lies always bring death. Isn't that how it was in the Garden of Eden? If you eat of this tree, you will surely die, said the Lord. And the devil said, no, I don't think so. You can eat of that tree too. Comfortable lie, right? And if you eat of that tree, you will not surely die, but actually everything will be better for you. Oh, how the devil loves to sow his deceit in our ears to this very day. Don't do those things that God says to do. Do it your own way. Follow your own path. Be your own leader. Find your own happiness. Forget about God and his ways, and follow your own ways. Be the master of your own destiny, the commander of your own soul. And yet, where do all of those ways always lead? The way of sin always leads to death, but the way of Jesus, the way of God and his word, always leads to life. It did for Father Abraham, by the way. Did you notice that? What ended up happening in the test? Abraham received his son back again as if coming back from the dead. For our God is the God who raises the dead. Our God is the God who takes what seems to be dark. Our God is the God who takes what seems to be a dead end and brings new life out of it. He did for Abraham. And you can bet that every day of Father Abraham's life, when he looked at his son, He was reminded of the resurrection. You are children of Abraham. So be children of the obedience of Abraham. Be children who follow in the faith of Abraham. And then you will find the great joy of Abraham. Isn't that how Jesus described Abraham? Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. When did Abraham see the day of Jesus? He saw it that day when he offered his son on Mount Moriah. He saw how God would provide a substitute, how God would provide a substitute who would bring life from death. And you have the same thing. For you know how God the Father sent his only son, his beloved son, Jesus, into the world. You know how God the Father did not stay the knife of his justice, but how he offered his son on the wood of the cross, on the altar of that cross. You know that he was offered in your place as your substitute. And so now every time you lift up your eyes and see, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, every time you hear the pastor say, take and eat the body of Jesus given for you, you have your little day at Mount Moriah. You have your day, like Father Abraham, of seeing the one who was sacrificed for you. You have your little hope of the resurrection restored into you. And so just like Abraham would have gone home rejoicing with Isaac, and every time he looked at his son Isaac, he would have been filled with joy, so also you. When you go home from this place, go home as those who know that death 
has been swallowed up by life, that there is a hope that nothing in this world can take away for Jesus. Your Jesus was offered in your place, and Jesus, your Jesus, is risen to bring you where he goes. Children of Abraham, do the works of Abraham. Be willing, be obedient, be faithful, and you will find that same joy of your father Abraham filling your heart and your life. To Christ be the glory now and always.